So far we've talked about tension, pulling on something, compression, smushing something, torsion, twisting something. Now we're going to talk about bending. So we're going to use our trusty rubber bar here so we can look at extreme deformation. And I've just again drawn grid lines on it uh, with a pen. And so the first thing I want you to focus on are these vertical lines, the vertical grid lines here in the undeformed configuration. And watch carefully what happens when I bend. So you notice they kind of splay out a little bit, uh, but that they remain straight. So that's our first observation is that vertical lines remain straight. The next thing I want you to focus on is the distance between those vertical lines at the top and at the bottom. So in the undeformed configuration, uh, it's the same. But when I bend it, especially if I bend it very extreme, you should be able to see now that the lines are closer to each other at the bottom. So down here, they're closer. And here, they spread apart a little bit. And so what does that mean? That means the material on the upper surface of the bar has to be in tension because it's elongating. And the material on the lower surface of the bar has to be in compression because it's getting squished. Uh, and we can also see this effect a little bit better with a larger bar here. So here's just a piece of foam where I've drawn some grid lines on it. And again, what I'm doing here is I have a piece of paper that's the size of one of these squares just so we can see kind of for reference. So in the undeformed configuration, the square fits nicely within these grid lines. And when I bend it, now we can clearly see that at the upper surface, there's elongation. At the lower surface, there's compression. In the middle somewhere, it looks like the bar has maintained its current length, right? That the, the distance from side to side uh, doesn't change. So you have two observations. Vertical lines remain straight, and that the top is in tension, the bottom's in compression. Now I put top and bottom in quotes because of course I could have bent the bar this way, but I think you understand at this point. The other thing, now, the next thing I want you to look at is the angle here, the angle of these grid lines as I bend the bar. So in this undeformed configuration, it's 90 degrees. And in the deformed configuration, if you look carefully and you study this very carefully, you'll notice that the angle remains 90 degrees. So the grid lines maintaining a 90 degree angle is important because it means there's no shear. Remember when we twisted things, we saw that the angle between the grid lines change. But when we bend it, even though there's deformation, there appears to be no shear because the grid lines are maintaining that 90 degree angle. And then the last thing that's important when we observe here is that when I bend it, this surface here, the shape that it creates in the deformed configuration right here is following a circle. And we can see this by using, well, let me just use some electrical tape here that's nice and round. And I just kind of lightly bend the bar. And when I put it up there, of course, this ends out here where I'm holding it is not circular. But you see that the shape very naturally follows a circle uh, right there in the middle. So we can use kind of a circular, you can think about things as following a circular arc right up here in the middle, especially where it's bending. So here are our observations. And now we're gonna use these to analyze what's the state of stress inside a bar when I bend it. So let's look at a sketch of our bar in pure bending. So for this bar, I'm applying a moment to the ends. I'm just applying a twist at the ends. The bar bends. And here I've sketched out our observations. The bar is following a semicircular arc. Our straight lines here, our grid lines that were straight in the original configuration remain straight. And we see that the deformation has to be happening along the upper and the lower surface. So let's sketch this out a little bit more carefully. So let's take an XY coordinate system tacked along here. So here, the XY coordinate system would be like such. At this location, it would be again following the radius outward from the center of our circle. And so therefore we call this line along the center Y equals to zero. And since our bar is of thickness H, we'll call this Y equals H over two as the upper surface. So in order to understand the strain, we have to understand how much this arc here has changed. So let's just, let's just focus on this one right now. So the strain there, the final length, minus the initial length, divided by the initial length. 
So we're assuming from our observations, if you're making this giant foam bar, that the line along the center is not deforming. The top is elongating, the bottom surface is compressing, but we're gonna assume that this one is uh, remaining the same. And we'll see that that has to be true uh, in just a minute. So let's think about what these terms in this equation are. So the initial length is just simply r times theta, because if we remember our geometry, this distance here is simply our radius of curvature times theta, so r theta. Because in the initial configuration when this bar is straight, this distance and this distance are the same. So the initial length is r theta. The final distance is gonna be r plus our distance y from the center line. So in this case of the upper surface, y would be h over two times theta. And now if we factor this out, we see that the thetas cancel out, the r's cancel, and so we're left with a very simple relationship, y over r. So when y equals h over two, that's the maximum strain and it's positive, meaning it's tension. When y equals minus h over two, we have the maximum strain, but it's compressive. So we've just derived a very simple expression for the strain. Now, since we are talking about a linear elastic solid, the stress is likewise nothing more than the elastic modulus times y over this radius of curvature. So now we have a very, very simple expression for the strain as a function of the distance from what's called the neutral axis this distance in the center. So the strain increases and therefore the stress increases as we move away from the neutral axis and it goes negative as we move down. So now let's consider some free body diagrams of our beam to under, better understand the stress distribution inside the bar. So here I've drawn a bar with a pure moment applied to the ends. In this case, I've drawn it straight because normally what's gonna happen is we're gonna be having cases such as with this metal bar here, this aluminum bar, where the amount of curvature and deformation is actually relatively small. And so here, just for convenience, I'm drawing the bar straight. Now let's imagine that I'm gonna cut this bar in half. So when I make a cut here in the bar, the bar is no longer in equilibrium because we're applying in a moment to this end, but nothing's counterbalancing it. So what has to counterbalance it is the stress acting on this surface, surface the internal state of stress of this beam in bending. Now we see that the stress has to be a linear function where it's zero in the center, so it's quite easy for us to sketch. So when we sketch the stress distribution, we see that it's zero along the center line, maximum tension here, maximum compression here, so it's just a line. Now for this bar to be in equilibrium, we have to consider the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments and set both of those to zero. So let's consider the forces first. So we want to sum all the forces and set that equaling to zero. Now, there's only forces acting in the x direction in this case, and it's a distributed force or a stress. So we're going to have to integrate. So if I integrate the stress from h over two to minus h over two from the top and the bottom of the bar, that better equal to zero. So if I put in my known stress distribution, I can pull my constants, Young's modulus, and the radius of curvature out of the integral. And we see when we compute this integral by symmetry, it in fact does equal to zero. So all this means is that our choice of saying that there is no strain along the center line, something that we observe from our experiment, is has to be true in order for the, our stress distribution to have some of the forces equaling to zero. So this just sets what we call the neutral axis or the line of zero stress comes from uh, computing this integral. So in this case, it's quite simple and it lies along the center line. We'll talk later about what happens if we have different shapes. Now we also have to sum the moments and those have to equal zero. So we have a moment applied to the end and we also have the stress here acting in this kind of push-pull configuration, which is it acting as a counteracting moment twisting into the page. So to say the sum of the moments equals to zero, I need to integrate not the stress, but the force times the distance. So stress times y dy. And in this case, this quantity isn't equal to zero 
that has to equal the applied moment. So now if we plug in our stress distribution, we get E and R pulling out of the integral, and now we have an integral of Y squared, because we have a Y for the moment arm and a Y for the stress increasing as we move away from the neutral axis. Not surprisingly, this quantity here has a special name that we call I, or the moment of inertia of the cross-sectional area of the beam. And we'll talk later about how we compute it for different shapes, but for now, let's just use it as a symbol. And so that gives us a quite simple thing, uh, relationship. It tells us that the moment applied to this beam has to equal E times the moment of inertia divided by the radius of curvature. Now that seems like a bit of an abstract uh, relationship here, so let's do a little bit of rearrangement. So now we have several observations that are contained in a few simple equations. So one is the strain increases linearly with y being the distance from the neutral axis. Hooke's law tells us that the stress and strain have to be proportional, so these are just equal to each other with the factor of E, Young's modulus or the elastic modulus. Some of the forces equaling to zero said that y equaling to zero needs to be set along the center line. And some of the moments equaling zero gives us a relationship between the moment that we apply, the stiffness of the bar, the moment of inertia of the cross-sectional area of the bar, and the radius of curvature. Now having the radius of curvature in here is a little bit inconvenient. So what we would typically do is combine these two expressions here. In this case, that the stress is simply my over i, which we get by simply substituting this relationship into here. So this is a very important expression in beam bending. It tells us if we know the bending moment and we know something about the cross-sectional area of the beam to be able to compute i, we know the maximum stress. So let's talk about computing the moment of inertia of the beam. So we have a beam of length l and the cross-section is given by a width b and height h, right? So it's our beam looking like this. So this is our beam of length L. This is the cross section that we wanna compute the moment of inertia of. So the moment of inertia is defined as the integral of the distance from the neutral axis squared, so y squared, over the entire area of the cross section. Rectangular beam, this is relatively easy to compute. So since nothing varies across this direction of the beam, I can pull that dimension out of the area and just multiply by B. And so I get an integral that looks like that. Integral of Y squared. When I compute the integral, I get the width B times Y cubed divided by three, evaluated at H over two and minus H over two. When I put in my values and my limits of integration, I get h cubed over eight and another h cubed over eight with those negative signs turning into a positive. So for a rectangular cross section, I get the moment of inertia of the area is 1 12th bh cubed. So in a later video, we'll compute the moment of inertia for some different cross-sectional shapes and talk about the ramifications for beam bending.